Before this evening's group meditation, let's explore the neuroscience of meditation. I think we can all agree that the villain of the first six Star Wars films was Darth Sidious. Our own version, our own inner Darth Sidious is found at the base of our brain. The big kids call it the amygdala, this region right here. It's sometimes known as our center of fear or our, our fear center or our fear and aggression center. Basically, us on our worst day. I would say towards the middle of the brain, in front and a little bit above. This is the uh, anterior cingulate gyrus. Fancy name, is it not? We could call it the hub of our mirror neurons. We could call it the seat of our empathy. I prefer to, re I prefer to refer to it as our inner qui -Gon Jinn. I just had a terrible thought and make sure that the audio is going. It appears to be going. Excellent. So, the, the $64,000 question, that, that's telling you how old I am. When I was a little boy, that was on TV. We got to see Betty White flirt with her future husband on that show. But how do we, how do we transition the handful of centimeters from our inner Darth Sidious to our inner Qui-Gon Jinn? The answer is two-part. The first part is... The mechanism driving mindfulness. And that would be our sympathetic nervous system. It is not even part of our brain. It's actually part of our spinal cord. It is ensconced. Now, some sources say it's ensconced in the region of the spinal cord that uh, the thoracic portion of the spinal cord. And so... It is not wired for active concentration. Then what is it wired for? It's wired for the opposite of active concentration, which is perception. That is, that is practiced vulnerably, passively, viscerally, and randomly. So let's use the, um, the metaphor of the movies. You and I are not the screenwriter. We are not um, the director. We're not even the producer or the actor. We're just a member of the audience sitting back and enjoying the ride. Because sometimes the movie is a comedy. Sometimes it is a tragedy. Sometimes it is an adventure. Sometimes it is a horror movie. And sometimes it's all the above. So this... The sympathetic nervous system can allow us to notice all manner of things, including sights, sounds, sensations, flavors, scents, and the like, including emotion, intention, thought, memory, and imagination. What are we to do with these things? That brings us to point four, the tissues that make meditation possible. Now, just as it was the sympathetic nervous system that drove mindfulness, it is the parasympathetic nervous system that drives meditation. You see, every time we exhale, whether we know it or not, we are accessing our parasympathetic nervous system, which has evolved for both physical relaxation as well as mental release. In fact, if you were to get playful, you might, you might say that mental relief serves the, surfs the wave of physical relaxation. Now, here's the really cool thing. I don't know if you are as lazy as me, but I love the path that this, I love the fact that this could be described as the lazy bastard path of enlightenment. 
We don't need to force mindfulness. It's already latent within every in-breath. We don't need to force meditation. It's latent within every exhalation. You see, my friends, over the vast ocean of time that saw the evolution of the three pound squishy supercomputer in the dark between our ears. The evolution seemed to be slapdash. It seemed to be random. It seemed to be as graceful as a Rube Goldberg contrivance. Or perhaps as if it was designed by the person who gave us Go Go Gadget, <laughs> Inspector Gadget. But anywho, this great big behemoth between our ears is so scattered. It's doing so many things. It's riding unicycle backwards while juggling flaming batons. It's got its hands full. And so it's almost subversive to think that all this big brain has to do is align its will, its volition, its intention with the ancient programming, the ancient wiring of our spinal cord. That's all the spiritual path is. And so with every inhalation, we could silently and mentally recite the demonstrative pronoun this. And with every exhalation, we could silently and mentally recite the verb relaxing. I look forward to chanting and meditating with you in approximately 80 or 90 seconds. Until then, how about a bit of the old housekeeping? This is Lama Jigme Gyatso of the Buddha Joy Meditation School. Welcome to Meditate Like a Jedi which is made possible due to the generosity of viewers just like you. If you love Star Wars and you wish to meditate as transformatively as young Luke Skywalker on Dagobah under the guidance of Yoda, be sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell. Good news. If at any point during this evening's live stream you have a specific question about Buddhist meditation, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist chanting, and how to apply them to your life, simply type your question in great detail in the chat window. Now, if you're watching on your laptop or your desktop, that chat window will be on the right. If, like most of us, you're watching on your smartphone, the chat window will be down below. Together as a team, let's chant the Friday night excerpt or selection from Garab Dorje's uh, spaciousness of Vajrasattva. One may even identify fully with the wrathful deity in the mandala of wrathful attributes, and unmistakenly manifest as a terrible and yet not experience the suchness in which concepts disappear. So, here's what we're being told. We don't need to squander our time and energy visualizing or contemplating. We don't need to visualize a paradise. We don't need to, need to visualize ourselves as some great celestial entity. We don't even need to contrive channels, winds, and drops, and bliss. One may crop a palm tree or burn a sea to prevent them proliferating. And some teachers even advocate such a destructive approach for students who wish to overcome their emotional problems. So, Sturgeon's Law reminds us that 90% of everything is poo poo caca, including meditation teachers. 
and they got meditation teachers enthusiastically giving all kinds of weird advice. Let's continue. Moreover, there are hundreds and even thousands of methods for practice, and they all blossom in their own way. But since pristine awareness is beyond characteristics, it is not revealed by practices such as these. The union of awareness and acquiescence, noticing and releasing. Is not revealed by the external visualizations of a paradise or of a celestial entity or of an internal visualization of channels, winds, drops, joys, and blisses. It is simply accessed, as described earlier, by noticing and relaxing in harmony with our inhalation and our exhalation. I'm going to put my phone on standby so it doesn't chirp its little brains out during class. That would be lame. Huh. Let's continue. Blessed are the yogis who abide continuously in the true condition, not discriminating between self and other. They enjoy the magical illusion while abiding in the great perfection. So, the true condition is another way of saying the centered spontaneity that flows from noticing and releasing. Consequently, They break free from, of, from the trap of duality. I'm a person, you're a person, we're both persons. I have all sorts of emotions, pleasurable and painful. You have all sorts of emotions, pain, pleasurable and painful. I have emotions, you have emotions. We're the same. We're the same. They enjoy the magical illusion while abiding the great perfection. So great is noticing, perfection is releasing. So there is this myth that if you're truly spiritual, you'll be a grim-faced fellow, looking like you've just been asked to drink straight vinegar, unable to find pleasure in anything. <clears throat> no. A yo a a a. a an ati, a mahasandhi yogi, a dzogchen naljorpa, is able to find pleasure. They are not attached to the pleasure because viscerally they get that pleasure is fleeting and that pain is fleeting. And that the body that can perceive pleasure and pain, pain is fleeting, as is the mind housed within the body, also fleeting. This is not something to be believed or understood. It's experienced viscerally because inhalation becomes exhalation. Perception becomes release, which becomes the next perception, which becomes the next release. And so we learn this not intellectually, but viscerally. And that's good. I don't know if you're as geeky as me, but you remember the first Ghostbusters movie released way back in 1984. Remember that bad boy? There's a scene on, I think it's the second to the last reel of the movie, where um, they're dealing with Zool. And um, on top of Diana's palatial apartment building. And uh, Vigman turns to Egon. And Egon says in a wonderfully intellectual way, I'm terrified by on the, by on the point of all rational thoughts. So in other words, I can't help you. 
And that is normal. That's how we are wired. When we are in peril, our electrical activity of our higher brain winks out and migrates to our underbrain, where we are not so loving and not so clever. The cool thing about meditation, when done properly, is that it relies on the very lowest portion of our central nervous system, the spinal cord itself, to notice and release. It cultivates not the cleverness to create a longer lasting light bulb, and there's nothing wrong with that, but the visceral wisdom of centered spontaneity, where our utterances and our choices and our deeds can flow from a place of love, centered, spontaneous, and uncontrived. And that is the greatest benefit of meditation. Ah, the joys of post-nasal drip, eh? Whoops, wrong button. Hmm. Aha. Uh -huh. There we go, that should do it. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, by the way, that text we just chanted from our Shastra and this, our Sadhana, are both available for free download. Everything I do is free. I'm stupid that way. We're going to begin with a very short chant. We're by chanting the concise version of Bodhicitta, whoopsie, Bodhicitta and Refuge to train the uh, neural pathways responsible for empathy and enthusiasm. Please chant with me. May I liberate all beings by relying on the three jewels. May I liberate all beings by relying on the three jewels. May I liberate all beings by relying on the three jewels. And now we come to meditation. Now we've already explained how meditation works during the lesson. So all we need to do is jump in right now. But remember, if at any point you have a question, simply type it in the chat window. I check for questions approximately once every seven to nine minutes. Let's dig in. I have had many meditation teachers. One of them, uh, Sokyal Toko, used to teach that our eyes are neither all the way open or all the way closed, but half-masked. For although we are not hiding from reality, we are relaxed as we confront it. So on the left, we see a kitty cat stalking its pet human, which reminds us to notice. 
And here we see a kitty cat laid back, reminding us to relax in harmony with our exhalation. Some people teach breathe from the nose, others teach breathe from the belly, but since our lungs are located in our chest, you may wish to breathe from your chest. Whether you call it Mahamundra or whether you call it Mahasandhi, tantric meditation tends to keep the eyes at least halfway open. Usually, there's always a reason occasionally to close your eyes. If you're having eye strain or if your mind is going berserk, like a little kid who's just had too much, uh, who's just drank a, a monster energy drink. So I, my eyes, my forehead really, really hurts right now. So I'm going to gently close my eyes. Do what's best for you. How do you know if someone is an authentic teacher? If you ask someone controlled by their rigidity and fear and controlling tendencies, they will say that someone is not a teacher unless someone I approves has approved of them. If, however, 
if someone who is flexible and loving and laid back would say, oh, you know, someone's a teacher by if their instructions work or not. If you receive their instructions and you apply them for about five minutes every 12 hours for seven consecutive days, and you get good results, then they're a good teacher. And if you get bad results, then they're a bad teacher.
We're going to switch practice texts right now because sometimes that's kind of fun. Please bear with me. What am I looking for? Looking for core, looking for secular, November. Well, that's weird. Okay. So quick like a bunny, I'm going to switch practice texts. The Buddha taught that there were eight and I'm sorry, four bases of mindfulness. So we're going to begin with Kaya Sati's only set of four preliminary meditations that center our bodies. Just like that kitty cat. That kitty cat looks pretty centered, wouldn't you agree? We begin with the first of Centering's four physical preliminary practices where we mindfully notice and investigate our relaxingly longer exhalations.
We now come to the second of centerings for physical preliminary practices, where we mindfully notice and even investigate the coalescence of our invigorating, sharper inhalations. The words, how much shorter? One moment. We, now we come to the third of centerings for physical preliminary practices. Hmm. where we allow our minds to mindfully notice and even investigate our bodies. Investigation is the second enlightenment factor, and it basically means the opposite of that being defensive.
We come to the fourth of Centering's four physical preliminary practices where we allow our bodies to tranquilly relax. Tranquility is the fifth enlightenment factor, and it is a natural function of our parasympathetic nervous system that we access during each exhalation. And of course, we're using the noun form as a synonym for body. We continue with Vedana Sati's set of four jhana meditations that center our feelings. We begin with the first of four feeling-oriented centering practices where we savor the first jhana's invigorating, blissful joy that flows from gently grinning the corners of our mouth, the apples of our cheeks, and the crow's feet of our eyes towards our bodies of flesh, blood, and bone. This particular exercise has been likened to um, contemplative caffeine. Esoteric espresso.
We continue with the second of four feeling-oriented centering practices, where we savor the second jhana's peaceful joy that flows once again from gently grinning with the corners of our mouth, the apples of our cheeks, and the crow's feet of our eyes towards our thoughts, emoting, intending, reasoning, recalling, and imagining. And so clearly we're using thoughts as an umbrella term. We continue with the third of four feeling-oriented centering practices where we savor the third jhana's contentment by mindfully noticing and investigating and coalescing our thoughts, emoting, intending, reasoning, recalling, and imagining. Now, now, think of this. As we breathe in, the air coalesces within our lungs. Coincidentally, uh, Every time we breathe in, we practice the sixth enlightening factor of coalescence.
We continue with the fourth of four feeling-oriented centering practices where we savor the fourth jhana's neutrality by allowing our thoughts, em emoting, intending, reasoning, recalling, and imagining to tranquilly relax, which is the not natural thing for them to do during each exhalation. We continue with Chitta Sati's second set of four jhana meditations that center our mind. We begin with the first of four mind-oriented centering practices where we savor the fifth jhana's metaphoric sphere of infinite spaciousness. by mindfully noticing, investigating, and coalescing our mind's ability to see, hear, feel, taste, smell, and the like. And again, we are using the first noun, mind, as an umbrella term.
We continue with the second of four mind-oriented centering practices where we savor the sixth jhana's metaphoric sphere of infinite awareness, which we generate by allowing our mind to invigoratingly gladden as towards it we gently smile once again from the corners of our mouth, the apples of our cheeks, and the crow's feet of our eyes. We now come to the third of four mind-oriented centering practices where we savor the seventh jhana's metaphoric sphere of non-graspability as we allow our minds seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling, and the like to tranquilly relax in the most sustainable way, which is the natural thing to occur every time we exhale.
We now come to the fourth. A four mind oriented centering practices. We receive the eighth jhana's metaphoric sphere of acquiescent non labeling by experiencing the liberating equanimity of our controlling tendencies to push and to pull. And this, of course, is the seventh enlightenment factor. Let us seal this evening's practice with a bit of the old chanting. May all beings practice of can communication, conduct and calmness for the spontaneous and uncontrived. May everyone be free from misery, may everyone be happy. May no one be separated from the happiness. May everyone have balance from the tyranny of hating, craving, and clinging freed. If you feel that I have earned it, you could type something in the chat window. You could give this live stream a thumbs up. You could share it with a friend. You could even help support this channel on Patreon.
In approximately 10 and 2 thirds hours, I would very much like to return to lead tomorrow's early morning lesson and meditation. Until then, may you and yours be happy and healthy. And if you are as geeky as me, this is the way. <laughs>